Hello everyone and welcome to Campus Connections, where we dive deep into the lives and stories of the incredible faculty and staff who make our campus a vibrant place to be every day. We'll explore their journeys, their inspirations, and the unique experiences that drive their commitment to Manhattan University. My name is Billy Walker and today we will be talking to our new campus ministers, Father Edward and Father Bob. How are you two today? Great. Doing Great well, here. Billy. Doing well. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, especially on our first episode of this little series. Is it your first episode? Yes, you two are the first oh, ones. Oh, wow. great in voyage. <laughs> so let's just dive right into it. Um, can you two share your personal journeys on how you came to the priesthood? Yeah, interesting. You're interesting. older, so you start. Interesting <laughs> question, yes. Um, well, I come from a working class family in Brooklyn, which was... Uh, a very Catholic kind of neighborhood and in some ways a kind of a Catholic ghetto. I mean, all of my <laughs> friends were Catholic. I didn't know anybody else. And uh, the church was across the street um, and almost everything happens within the confines of the parish. And like Brooklyn, everything happens on your block. You don't need <laughs> anything else. Across the street was the Catholic grammar school, all eight, eight grades, all nuns. Uh, my cousin Arlene, is a nun, oh. sister of St. Joseph. So I guess I grew up, you know, in that framework of Catholic school, Catholic high school. And um, I made a retreat uh, on Shelter Island, New York, which is for a boy from Brooklyn. Where is that? I didn't know. <laughs> My parents wanted me to go to some special thing one weekend, and I didn't want to go. And so I was down in the cafeteria of my high school, Severian High School in Brooklyn. And my best friend was named Billy. Ah. And I said, uh, how am I going to get out this weekend? And we saw a sign and it said, make a retreat with the Passionists on Shelter Island this weekend. And I said, God, that's, I don't know what a retreat is. I don't know where Shelter mm -hmm. Island is. I asked him, what do you think? He says, I think you have to pray a lot. I said, you go with me. I said, okay. And I told my mother and father, I told a lie, <laughs> um, that I had to go to Shelter Island. The brothers said, I have to go. So uh, we went out and um, it was such a wonderful experience. I guess it's what the kids talk about with about Kairos. You know, it, it just, um, it touched me, you know, somehow. And the priests there, uh, Passionist priests, and brothers um, touched me. And uh, from that point on, that seed somehow was planted and I began to think that that's something I might want to do with my life. Amazing. Father Edward, what about you? Well, my story is a little bit different, though it involves uh, Father Bob's uh -huh. story. And I also went to the same high school nine years after he was there. And I had to make that same retreat on Shelter Island. So that, it too, is where I encountered the Passionists. And I was impacted by the retreat, but I, I don't think I was transformed by it. I remembered it. But then when I went to college and I was actually studying uh, theater and drama, and then I was working on Wall Street full time while, while I was going to college, it was a very kind of tumultuous year. And I remembered the peace of that place and that experience. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly my parents, that first year of October, said, we have a young deacon in our parish, and he's really good. You should come to Mass, and we think he's preaching this weekend. So I said, oh, all right. You know, I wasn't really big on going every week, but I said, all right. So I show up at the Saturday vigil. It was Halloween, and the deacon who was about to be ordained a priest that May, got up into the pulpit in a Halloween mask. And that's how he began the homily. And it was this guy. Oh! <laughs> when I was 17 years old. And I said, wow, he's becoming a passionist. And that's the same retreat house, Shelter Island, where I had been. And I met him, and he seemed very happy. And so I called them up and I said, you know, I'd like to just come back for a weekend to this place, Shelter Island, and experience it again. And I went back, took the train out, and it was a peace-filled, no retreat on, just me and 
the brothers and priests who lived there. And that same peace that Father Bob spoke about, that same sense that these people were doing something meaningful and something that I wasn't experiencing working on Wall Street, I wasn't experiencing with what I was studying. And so I made a switch and I thought, I'm going to try this. And the following year, I transferred colleges, started living with the Passionists in Massachusetts, finished my studies at college up there. And here we are. That's awesome. Yeah. I was gonna I was gonna ask how you two like became like a dynamic duo, if you could say that. <laughs> um, and then my next question would be, um, how did you two end up at Manhattan University? How did you hear about it? Or did the archdiocese place you here? How did that work out? Well, a Christian mm -hmm. brother uh, of De La Salle here at Manhattan University comes to me for spiritual direction. Mm -hmm. And he happened to mention that they were losing their campus minister and they were going to be looking for a new one. And Father Bob was working at Calvary Hospital at the time, which is a terminal for terminally ill mm. patients. And he'd done that for two years. And you can speak to that. And it was exhausting. And I said, gee, you know, is it full time or part time? Because I do other ministries and Father Bob does other ministries and we neither one of us could do a full time. And when we found out it was full time, we said, well, what about both of us as co-directors of campus ministry? And then we'll kind of share the responsibility. And that's kind of right how it came to be. Yeah, I had a wonderful experience, almost three years um, at uh, Calvary Hospital. I don't know if you know it, it's in the Bronx. Um, it's a 200 bed. Um, palliative care hospital, Catholic hospital. Uh, and so almost everybody there is dying. You know, right. they're in the, the last sometimes few days, sometimes few hours, certainly few weeks of their lives. And I was the one of the chaplains there. And it was a very um, moving, very grounding experience. And uh, and I, I really did. I, I, I love the ministry there. Um, but sometimes when you deal with that much death and dying, about 150 people die there yeah, a I month. Um, you know, it, it, sometimes you also have to step away from it. Mm -hmm. And my ministry um, before that uh, was in administration and... Uh, I was often closing houses and doing funerals of priests and brothers. And it was just a lot of closure and death and dying. And so when this opportunity came and uh, I talked to our provincial, our boss, you know, about it, and he, uh, he kind of encouraged me in that, in that direction, you know, that, uh, um, you know, I began with the Christian brothers, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in youth ministry and, um, you know, this, I shouldn't say it's this way to end, but uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to say Your that way. Act. Yeah, it's not, it's not like, the, hopefully it's not the last hurrah, but, you never uh, know. But, to, <laughs> but to be able to work with the brothers again, uh, very much in the Lasallian tradition, some of my closest friends are Christian brothers, and to be able to and work. And you're an affiliate. I'm an oh. affiliated member of the Christian brothers, and so I said, you know, this sounds like it might be of God. And I talked to my spiritual director about it, and she says, you know, sometimes God just meets you where you need to be, and you just follow it and trust. So that's how I wound up here. Nice. Yeah. Well, we're happy to have you. Thank I know you. for me, I enjoy you at church every Sunday. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Really. Now, a key part of every service of church is the homily, when the priest gives the homily. Um, is there a big difference for the two of you? Uh, because clearly at a university or a college, there's a certain age group that's always there that typically isn't there at your regular church. Mm -hmm. um, do you go about creating it differently for college students than you would um, a real church outside of a college or university? I would say it's, it's no different for me in how I would think about and prepare a homily. But 
perhaps the way in which I would present it and the specifics of what I would talk about or the examples might be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. In other words, I really believe in using story and narrative in mm -hmm. preaching. I think that's what the gospels are, the parables Jesus taught with stories, and that's why we remembered them. And I think you can give a lot of spiritual theological theory at times that just washes over people and they'll never remember it. But if you can attach it to life experience or a similar story or parable in which what you're trying to say is exemplified and then relate it to the gospel or to world events or to whatever's happening, I think that has more of an impact because it says, well, how does this affect me? How does it touch me? And so I think the process for me is the same, but perhaps because of the audience, what I might talk about would hopefully be concerns that you all would have and can tap into, whereas maybe some of the things that I would speak about with a more diverse, larger community would not be that. Yeah, I, I would very much um, agree with that uh, and have, would have some of similar approach. Uh, I think that um, Jesus, Met, met people where they were in life, you know, and not where anyone else thinks that they should be. Right. And, you know, for young people, especially for all of us, you know, but for young people, I think in a special way, it's a time of searching. It's a time of questioning. It's a time of getting in touch with who I am, loving the person that I am. Um, maybe dealing with some hurts in life. And also, you know, the, the world is so open in so many different ways. And so to be able to, to speak to that reality in story, too, mm -hmm. which is Jesus did most of that. He mostly told stories. Right. And then people could kind of, you know, relate to it out of their own life. And I think it helps me too to go into my own life and say, well, you know, maybe this happened in my life. Um, and maybe that story of my life, sharing it with you, can help you to share your story as well. You know, or we all have a story. I mean, we all, we all are called to love. And sometimes love is, uh, you know, straight and narrow. We know exactly where we're going. Right. And then other times, you know, twists and turns and dead ends and potholes and, you know, those kinds of things. And it's all good. It's all good. And to create a safe space for people in our preaching that God can touch us anywhere in our life, even if at times when we feel the most, quote unquote, sinful, God might be right there saying, come on, come on, come on, just come, trust me, trust me. Huh. Beautiful. And then for our last question, um, what are your hopes for the future of the congregation at Manhattan University and the church as a whole? We can start with you, Father Bob. Well, <clears throat> thank you. Um, <laughs> well, right now, I mean, the whole church is going through what's called a synod. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pope Francis has invited all sorts of groups um, together to talk about the future of the church, to talk about the presence of the church. And he opened it by saying, all are welcome. Everyone is welcome. Whoever you are, whatever your life story is, whatever your journey, all, all are welcome. And I think it's the same thing here with us. You know, it's, uh, I love walking around the campus. Um, such a diverse oh, yeah. community, such a diverse in, in uh, all sorts of aspects. And, and um, to see that there are all sorts of organizations of welcome mm -hmm. to different people. Um, and also, I think for us to create a community where people feel safe, that they can be who they are, they can believe or not believe, um, it's okay, you know, it's okay that we just uh, support each other and people feel, I was saying to Edward today, it, it's like, I love coming in here, you know, you're coming up from the subways in the Bronx and all, and then you all of a sudden you're in this oasis, you know, of green. It's, yeah. um, 
maybe that's what we can do for each other, you know, create an oasis where, um, where people can really feel together. Father Edward, what about you? I mean, I wouldn't have too much to add to that. I think that my perspective would be very, very similar. I do think that a lot of times the perception of, we both happen to be Catholic priests as campus ministers. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think a lot of times the perception of the Catholic Church is that it's a more closed community or more exclusive or not as welcoming. And so I think our mm -hmm. task and our job in a very diverse community that also includes Jewish people and Muslim people and people who are agnostic or atheist, that we are ministers to the whole community here. You know, and while we want to emphasize that 7.30 Mass on Sunday, I think even people who are not Roman Catholic can be welcome to that. Mm -hmm. And they may not be receiving communion, but they can join in great music and beautiful prayer and hopefully good preaching and be part of a community experience. And we're going to add a social yeah, dimension maybe, to that. Maybe a little bit of pizza. Pizza, pizza as well. <laughs> you know, like that, draw pe draw that, people okay. in, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's just that, you know, what Father Bob was saying about feeling that this is an inclusive, safe space and a space of welcome. And I, I think that's how, you know, we're, we're, the Italian tradition is also about service of others, especially the needy and the poor. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you get there to do that or you're inspired to do it until you're rooted in something, until you really feel like there's a tradition behind you or a meaning behind of why now I have to take that out and I have to share it. Mm -hmm. And so if we could get to a place of creating that sense of community and safe space and welcome, and then say, okay, now how do we help extend this? How do we bring it out? I mean, I think that's our primary mission and goal here. Perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and coming. Thank you I'm for so inviting happy. us. I'm so Thanks, happy this Bill. happened. Great yeah. to be here. Yeah, good to we'll be here. We'll get other people to do this as well. Um, now, for the viewers at home, if you at your time at Manhattan University have felt like you have had a faculty or staff member that has truly enlightened your time here at Manhattan University, reach out to us. They can be our next guest on this, and even you can interview them if you want. So <laughs> thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next episode.